G'day guys, Nick Dingle here again for lesson number eight. We're going to be talking about errors and how you debug those errors using various tools. Now, how many of you have run into this problem already? You've written a line of code, there's a yellow squiggly line, and when you hit play, it just goes, I don't know what you're doing. Plain and simple. Your code crashes, it doesn't work, you give it to your friends, it doesn't operate the way you expect it to, and they go, huh, what's this? Essentially, you have created yourself an error, okay? And it is now your job to figure it out. Now, this one's a very easy error to figure out, if you remember the rule of thumb. Oh, yeah, no capital letters on these commands. But sometimes you're tired, sometimes you just want to get it out the door, and you've just completely forgotten, you know, quite basic things. I've done it plenty of times. The first thing is to have a look for Visual Studio telling you that you've done something wrong. And you go, ah, of course, little p. Okay, problem solved. You hit play and then happy days. You're all good to go. However, this is a very simple error and you're going to run into lots of other problems. Whether it's your app crashing, whether it's freezing, whether it's producing the wrong result, whether it's just not running at all and you get a gray screen. Errors are, or bugs for that matter, are the bane of most programmers' existence. And so today we're gonna to go through the types of errors that you're gonna encounter because it's good to have a name for those kind of things. But we're also gonna investigate different ways that you can try and find those bugs and fix those bugs. Now, there are three major types of errors, okay? Some might argue there are more, but there are three main categories. There is a syntax error, where the code you wrote doesn't match the rules of the programming language. Like what I just did there with a capital P for print, that didn't match the rules, so I had just made a syntax error. It's like me saying, dog is the red. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I've got words in there, they're all correct words, they're just not put in the right order. But if I said the dog is red, it makes a lot more sense, because the first sentence had a syntax error. Second type that you've probably encountered plenty of times while using other people's apps, or even your own for that matter, is a runtime error. So a runtime error is where it crashes while the app is running. You're using it, you're playing around with it, and all of a sudden, bang, you get the red X, or it just freezes, it locks up, or it just shuts down. Or in PlayStations, you get that lovely blue screen. Okay, that is a runtime error. It's because the app tried to do something that it really shouldn't do and Windows or whatever operating system has to shut it down. Now, the last type there we've got is more known as bugs to people. They're what patches tend to fix a lot of. And it's like little maths errors, or we got the wrong output, that this is the wrong result, or I tried to shoot my gun and it's telling me I've got no ammo, but I've got 50 bullets. Okay, that's a logic error. Okay, it's where the code produces the wrong output. Doesn't crash, but it still runs. Okay, that's a logic. So syntax, runtime, and logic. And they all happen sort of at different times. Syntax obviously happens while we're coding and hitting play trying to run it. Runtime happens while it's running and it hits like a very bad line of code. And logic is like, man, I'm going to keep on going. But again, it happens while you're running. All right. So quick examples. You've written code and it doesn't match those rules that I was just talking about. Okay. Pause the video. Don't read the left-hand side of the slide. See if you can pick all the errors that I've written here. So pause and go. Now, line one should be a little p. Line three, no quotes around, pick a number. Doubles or singles, doesn't matter. Line five, there should be a colon at the end of the if statement. Line six, first of all, it should be indented and the quotes that I've used don't match. So double at the start and double at the end, or singles, okay? Pick your poison. Okay, what about a runtime error? Well, in this case, I've written num equals 10, and then I've said print great plus num. As I showed in the previous video, or a couple of videos ago, you cannot add a string and a number together. That doesn't work, okay? So just be wary of that. Now, there are other types of runtimes error. This is like a mismatch of data types or a data type mismatch. However, if you try and do things like open a file that doesn't exist, because you can open files in code, otherwise we can't save things. If you try and open a file that doesn't exist, you get a file doesn't exist error. If you try and divide by zero, you get a 
division by zero error. If you try and repeat something, we'll talk about loops in the future, and that loop never stops, you get what's called an infinite loop. That's where your program goes gray and it says not responding. Okay, so those are runtime errors. They halt your program. They stop it. It can't move on. It's pretty bad. What about logic errors? Logic errors are just where you make a mistake or you forget one little thing or an if statement fires off the wrong way or maybe you didn't indent something correctly so a line of code belongs to the wrong if statement, all that kind of stuff, okay? But the most important thing is it does not crash. And in this example here I'm giving, I said age equals 18. If age is greater than 18, you can vote in Australia. Otherwise, you cannot vote. Now, there's a logic error there. And the logic error is because if you are 18, my code is going to tell you you can't vote. But that's not the case. You can vote when you're 18 in Australia. So this should be a greater than or equal to. Or change it to greater than 17. Either way, it's the exact same logic. Okay? But that's the idea of a logic error is it doesn't crash. It just misbehaves. It's a bug. Okay? Okay, so let's jump over to Visual Studio and let's have a look at some of these errors and how we can identify and fix them. So I've put basically every single error that you saw, plus a few more from the slideshow into this script. Now, a couple of things quickly. Obviously, you can identify errors by the underlines, but mostly the only errors that Visual Studio is going to pick up are going to be your uh, syntax errors. So where the rules don't meet up with your line of code or vice versa for that matter. You can see on line three, I've written num7. Visual Studio is like, what? What are you trying to achieve? Okay. Hopefully you know what I'm trying to achieve, but yeah. Then I've got if dog. Again, no idea what it's talking about. Generally speaking, when you start receiving errors and when you start receiving, I'm going to get rid of that for a second, warnings, they start appearing in your error window. Now, if we open this up, problems window, sorry, you can see it lists every single error and every single thing that it does not like. Now, two things about this. You should always deal with errors. Sometimes you do not have to deal with warnings. So for example, this year I was doing uh, Pygame Zero with some of my students and we were getting warnings all over the place, but our code still worked, okay? So it's just sometimes you have to deal with those warnings case by case. But second thing is always deal with the first error, okay? The first error often is the one you have to deal with, and sometimes that will fix two or three errors below it, okay? So make sure you do them from top to bottom. Now, this error in particular is because I'm an idiot and didn't put the assignment operator, and you can see two errors gone straight off the bat. Next one here. This if statement doesn't make sense. So let's quickly fix that to a lowercase if. Look at that. That's two more gone. If dog. And then what about what am I doing with that if statement? There's no line of code. The reason this is producing an error is because there's no indented block of code under the if statement. Now, if you want an if statement, but the code's not ready yet, you can actually type in what's called a pass. All pass means is, hey, Let's move on with our lives. Pass this line, let's keep on going, okay? And you can see because there's now an indented line of code, that fixes the line below it. So sometimes an error isn't the line above that was the problem. Oh, sorry, it wasn't that line that was the problem, it was the one above, okay? Next one. So you notice when I click on these, it automatically jumps to the line, okay? That's really handy. It even tells you what line, LN short for line. Okay, let's put the proper quotes around these. Look at this, we're almost done. Okay, if should have a colon on the end. And because this line's not indented, it's going to have a whinge and mismatched. And look at this. All of my problems are solved just by going through and fixing those errors in the error window. Okay, and looks pretty good so far. However, it doesn't fix those logic errors that we were talking about. The only way to A, discover the logic errors is to play with your program and put lots of different data in and to make sure you're actually going through line by line and checking it. So this is a great time to talk about a few other things. Now, I've already talked about the error window, so I'm going to skip over this slide. Debugging. Debugging is literally the process of locating and fixing the errors that you've got in your code. Now, debugging tools 
or debugging techniques are what you can use. Some are really great at picking up some types of errors. Some other ones are great at picking up other types of errors. So depending on the error you've got, you will use different tools or techniques. Okay, the four main ones that I like to talk about with my classes are breakpoints, single line stepping, watches, and output statements. Now, breakpoints are probably my favorite one and the go-to for most people. Breakpoints are where you put in a line of code where your program will physically pause and wait for your input, okay? Now, in order to use breakpoints, so let's say I wanna put a breakpoint on this if statement here. If you hover over these lines, you can simply click here and that giant red bubble now indicates a breakpoint has been added on this line. And when it touches that line of code, it will pause. No more execution will happen, all right? So for example, if I press play, okay, you'll notice that it actually skipped down to line 16, which is down here. It actually skipped past my breakpoint. And that's because when you hit play, it's just running the file raw. It's not debugging it. In order to debug something and have your breakpoints work, you've either got to run through this window here or you press F5 on the keyboard. I prefer the F5 method. If it comes up and asks you what config you use, select Python. All right, so as you can see, my window is very, very cluttered. So let's bring this down a bit. So it's run all these lines of code. You can see num and age and everything has been allocated a value. But when we hit line 10, it has paused execution and it is frozen. Right here tells us paused on breakpoint, okay? This yellow bar indicates what line of code we paused on. So that line of code, is yet to actually run. Okay, that's what's really important. This line of code is not yet run. But what this allows us to do is it allows us to access the variables window. So we can see what's going on in our variables, what values they are, what they've changed to, what data type they are, all that kind of lovely stuff with this. You can also change them. If you wanna force a value just to check something, I wouldn't recommend it all the time, but it's very handy in certain circumstances. Uh, and then you've got a watch window, and I'll talk about that later on, but you can have a look at what's going on there. Now, you can even mouse over a couple of things here in your code, and it will tell you the value of your variables, like so. All right, and then you get this lovely control panel at the top. This is your continue button. That is, these are your step buttons, which I'll talk about soon. That is restart, and that is stop. So for the moment, let's hit stop, and I'm going to bin that. All right, so this is the process of debugging. Incredibly handy. It allows you to inspect those variables, see what's going on, all that kind of stuff. Okay, now one thing I didn't quickly show you, if I press F5 again, let it run, and the breakpoint hits. If you go, oh, I think I fixed my bug. I actually want to just keep going. You can hit the continue button, and it will actually continue down your code. Now, because we're debugging, notice that the error occurred but it actually occurs here in a separate window and the code's actually paused at the moment. So I can go in and inspect my line of code and go, ooh, what's it doing? Like, oh, do I need to change something? Oh, it's because it's a string in it. Okay, stop, fix your code, press play and see if it happens again. Okay, so we can quickly do that. Let's fix that error. There we go, problem solved. Okay, jumping back. Next thing that I like to do, excuse you. Okay, already explained that. I explained that. Next thing, single line stepping. So single line stepping allows the programmer to take control of how fast the code gets executed. Okay, and this is typically used in conjunction with a breakpoint. So breakpoint to pause, and then we use single line to go through one line of code at a time. And that sounds arduous and boring, and it sometimes is, especially when you've got hundreds of lines or you've got loops and things like that. But it allows you to see what the hell is going on, how your if statements are working, how variables are being changed, what kind of inputs affect your program, all that kind of stuff, okay? And there are three single line stepping buttons. There is step over, step into, and step out. Now, 
I haven't talked about functions yet, but I'm going to mention the word functions. And a function is just a chunk of code with a name. All right? So think of it like the print function does a few things. It's a chunk of code. It's a function. Input is a function. I keep calling them commands, but technically they're functions. But let's have a look at this. So step over, if you've got a function on your line of code, it will run that line of code and ignore all the code inside the function. That isn't, it will execute all the code in the function. It just goes over the top of it. It assumes you already know what's in that function and you don't want to check each line of code there. Step into is the opposite of that. It still runs a line of code, but it goes inside functions and it does every single line of code inside them. Okay, step out. I te tend to use the step into most of the time. Step out is when you're inside a function and you're like, eh, I'm pretty happy with this. I want to get out and go back to my main code. You press step out, it jumps out of your function, doesn't jump out, it actually does all the lines and then goes back to the main and waits for you to press another step button. Okay, so this is single line stepping. Let's have a look. Let's press F5. Okay, we are frozen on this line of code and I tend to like to step into because that's just my default. Okay, back from Visual Basic days. If I press that or F11, you can see it actually skips down to here. This line of code is executed. Let's press F11. It does the next line. You can see that just changed, it flashed. Okay, it then prints. We then ask for a number. It changes. You can even see it's a string now because I typed in from input, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so single line stepping is a fantastic way of sort of going through your code, trying to break it down and look at what is going on step by step by step. It's really handy, I find, with if statements, especially when you're struggling to understand what an if statement does. Okay, next one, the watch window. Now, technically the watch window is just the bit at the bottom, but I like to put both of these together. I've already explained about the variables window at the top that we can see what the values each of our variables has, what data type they are, all that kind of stuff. If you want to as well, go nuts and have a look at the special variables and the globals. I would really recommend the special ones because they are intense if you don't know what you're looking at. But the watch windows, this is the interesting part in my opinion. A watch window is where you can add in your own expressions and monitor certain parts of your script. So for example, I could simply just put age and it does the same thing as the variables window. It just tells me age is 18. Now, why would I do that? Well, maybe my variables window is just too big and I just want to monitor one or two variables. Maybe I've got a hundred variables, okay? Well, then I can just put it in the watch window and I can monitor it there. What if I also want to monitor the expression? Well, age is greater than 18. And it actually tells me true or false, if that is the case, okay? I can even go a little bit nutty and type in type of num is str. How crazy is that? You can actually monitor the data types of your variables and all those kind of things in a watch window. So using conjunction with breakpoints, you can start to see what's going on. Now I could sit here and go, I've got a logic error. Why is this not working? You go, age is greater than 18 fault. I'm an idiot. It should be eight greater than or equal to. Use a single line stepping. Oh, well, that's not going to work because I changed the line of code while it was running. And now we can vote. And you'll notice it jumped over the else part and continues on its merry way. Okay. Whoops. And look at that. Because I've now used input or num, it set it to a string and it's now true. So watch windows can be extremely handy when it comes to trying to figure out these logic errors or just monitor very specific things that are going on in your program. So that brings us to the very last and the simplest of debugging techniques. It's not really a tool, it's a technique more than anything. And most people will use this before they even know it's got a name. And they're called output statements. And it simply is you print a message somewhere. It could be in a text file. It could be in a window in the background that the user can't see, or it could literally just be on the screen. You print a message to say either, this is the value of my variable at this time, because you don't want to use a breakpoint. You're too lazy to do that. Or you print a message to say, we are here now. Did the user pay? 
print, yes, they paid. Something like that. Okay, so let's have a quick look. Let's get rid of all this code up here. Whoops, pressed the wrong button. Let's bring in this if statement. So you can see I'm printing a menu for my game. I'm asking the user what they chose. And then I print that choice to the screen to make sure that my variable is capturing the right value. I'm going to start that again. There we go. Type in B and it says choice B. Just spits it back out on the screen. So that is a debug. And I've put a little to-do message above it to say, oh, get rid of it when you're done. Okay. The next thing is when I choose A, I don't have any of that code ready yet. And rather than doing a pass, I can say new game chosen. So I can tell that that if statement is working perfectly. Okay. In the opposite case, if I type in a little a and I get no message, I know that, I know that, that if statement is not working and I need to either add in or choice equals a or something else, okay, to try and fix my code. And that's the great thing about the uh, output statements. They just allow you to sort of monitor where you're up to in your code. And boys and girls, that brings us to the end of this lesson. Go and try out all those techniques on all the different scripts that you've made in the past. Look at the error window, all that stuff. But I'll catch you in the next video.